Hello, um, I'd like to welcome you to um, the European Open Distance Learning Week EODA LW 2020 uh, webinar. We'll be starting in just a minute. We're just going to give a couple of minutes for, uh, for people to enter in the room and become virtually comfortable, whatever that means. So the title of uh, today's session is we are all in this together, raising to the challenges, because if there's one thing we've got in in common at the international level is having to had to adapt to the, the pandemic and um, try and support the uh, edu education institutions and the uh, teachers and students we've had near to us. So this uh, gives us the opportunity to, to share some experience and, um, and also give you uh, our feedback on this. Or rather the panelists are gonna give you their feedback on it. I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm just here to prevent fighting. So uh, if there were any. Okay, so please say hi in the um, in the chat. Tell us where you're from, and um, later on, if you want to ask any questions, please use the the Q and A tool for that because uh, sometimes it's hard to, to pick it up in the uh, in the chat. Okay, great to see such a wide uh, wide participation. Slovenia. Hmm. Okay, I think we can. I think we can. Uh, we can begin now. So the aim of uh, today's session is to understand how four leading professional bodies um, have supported online and distance learning during the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, I'm fortunate to have with me today representatives of Eden, the European Distance and E-Learning Network, USDLA, United States Distance Learning Association, OO. Um, ODLAA, the Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia, and FLANS, the Flexible Learning Association of, uh, of New Zealand. So I'm going to very briefly present our, our speakers to give them some chance to, uh, to, to talk. So firstly, we have uh, Sandra uh, Kuthina Softik, who's the president and, um, of Eden and the assistant director of uh, education and user support at the University of Zagreb, the Computer Centre. Then we have Lisa Maria Blaschke, who is a former Eden um, Executive Committee member, um, an Eden Senior Fellow, and a chair of the board of the Eden Fellows Council. Then we have Rhonda Blackburn. Rhonda is the president of the US DLA and uh, US DLA Hall of Flame, Fame inductee. She's the past president of the Texas Distance Learning Association and past chair elect of the National University um, Technology Network. We have Reggie Smith III. Reggie is the Chief Executive Officer and Executive Director of USDLA. And in his current capacity, he provides leadership to the association members and partners. We have Marcy Powell, who's the President and CEO of Marcy Powell and Associates, has been at the forefront of many pioneering achievements in the workplace for the last 25 uh, years. And lastly, but by no means least, Mike Brown, who's the director of the National Institute for Digital Learning at um, Dublin City University, and he serves on Eden's executive committee, and he's an Eden fellow. He's also an executive committee meeting of the Open and Distance Learning Association of Australia. So I think um, I'm going to hand over to, um, to Sandra to start the, the presentation. So I'm just going to share my desktop with you. Hopefully you can see that. Let's move this yeah. down out the way. Okay, Sandra, over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tim. Just let me uh, exit full screen. Yeah, so hello everyone, warm welcome to one more session in the European Online and Distance Learning Week. Um, this year we have uh, really, uh, I would say, uh, outstanding uh, sessions, uh, more than we thought we would have, but uh, very, very high uh, quality session. And I'm very happy that today we have a joint session with other uh, 
bodies uh, working uh, on online and distance uh, learning. So I'm very happy to have Rhonda, Reggie and Marcy with us today and Mark representing Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the title, as you can see, is, uh, I would say, challenging uh, for our thoughts uh, th to think how can we all rise to the challenges? And this is the idea uh, what we uh, should talk about uh, today, how all of us can contribute uh, and uh, make that education uh, is better and that we uh, that all educators, educational institutions benefit from our work. So if you can move uh, Tim to the next slide, please. So let me just briefly present the Eden and what we as Eden have done uh, so far. So uh, I'm going to do uh, some slides and Lisa will help me in that. So Eden Association is celebrating 30 years uh, next year in June. So we are, I would say, uh, young in hearts, old in existence. Um, so we as the network, uh, as association, exist to share knowledge and improve understanding among professionals in distance and e-learning. And as you can see, to promote policy and practice across the whole of Europe and beyond. I would say that with our engagement, we have uh, um, attracted number of educators, not only from Europe, but worldwide, to join and to collaborate uh, and to um, make uh, some moves, some changes, uh, uh, what is going to be with education. Uh, next slide, team, please. Uh, here are the numbers which are characterizing the Eden uh, in 2020. You can see that uh, we have uh, almost 200 institutional members, almost 300 individual members, that this is a network of uh, thousand, more than 1,000 individuals from 55 countries and actually over 140 uh, institutions from Europe and other countries. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. And also, we have very good collaboration with European Commission, who is using uh, our uh, association as way of communicating channel uh, to the educators for their messages, but also they're using us in, in another way that our uh, knowledge and expertise are heard in European Commission when some documents uh, and policies are prepared. Uh, I have I've been I stressed in this slide uh, two things um, which I find very important within Eden. This is Eden a network of academics and prof professionals first, and the steering committee as the body working uh, on this. We have quite a fresh elected uh, new NAP steering uh, committee elected in June this year. And uh, their aim is to support a network of these individuals uh, and to help them to gather and to communicate uh, more effectively uh, uh, by within our organization. Uh, so far in this year, for example, we had 10 Eden and NAP webinars and you can see that number of participants is quite high. Another uh, body is Eden Fellow Council, which is uh, chaired by uh, Lisa, and they serve as advisory role uh, in Eden. They are kind of our, our think tank, uh, uh, the people uh, with uh, really a great expertise uh, and knowledge who uh, can be who, who uh, is here to benefit us all, and I'm happy that Marcy is also Eden Fellow, so she can only she can as well contribute uh, in the, her work uh, to the Eden uh, uh, community. And now I'm going to give the the slides to to Lisa, who will maybe uh, I'm certain say a few words may, more about Fellow Council, but continue with our activities this year, which we um, did in order to uh, raise the challenges of COVID-19. So Lisa, floor is yours. Thank you, Sandra. Um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that Sandra has mentioned is the Eden Fellows Council. And we really did, uh, we've had the fellows around for a very, very long time, for a couple of decades. And a couple of years ago, we realized that we weren't using the potential of the fellows. And so we created this fellows council uh, and identified it, some, some really key council projects that we could work on in terms of um, using the synergies within the organization and across the organization, not just within Eden, but outside of Eden. And so we identified a couple of projects um, that the board members are working on together with the other fellows. And these are on looking at the current and future open education trends and looking at those within 
in a specific context. Uh, and then looking at the strategic development of Eden, where do we want to be by 2030? Uh, and how are we going to get there? And, and what role will the different people play, uh, the different parts of the organization play in, in realizing that st those strategies? And then, of course, we've got our Eden community. How can we strengthen that community? And what kinds of roles are there? What kinds of responsibilities? Uh, and what are the values of our members? And, and how can we, we, we really build that community? And, and as I said, uh, create synergies across the organization. Next slide. One of the key ways that we did this, when the pandemic hit in March, uh, the head of the NAP Steering Committee, Committee, Antonella, came to us and she said, we need to do something, we have to do something. And this was something that I think was in the back, back of the minds of, of all of us. What can we do? How can we help? And so what we decided to do was to, to hold webinars. And, and these were really very practical webinars where, where we were providing input to, um, to those who were making that pivot into online. And, and, and so we sat down, it was the uh, members of the steering committee, uh, the, the fellows council, the, the NAP steering committee. And we started to look at what are really the, the pain points of our community? What are, what are the things that people are really struggling with at the moment? And each week we would meet to identify what were the key topics? What were the things that were, that, that, that people really need to have addressed first. And, and so we did this every single week and each week we would come up with a new, um, a new topic based on what the current situation was. Because as you know, as the pan pandemic raged across the world, there became new issues and, and new challenges that people were facing. So we were trying to reach them where they were at at that particular point in time. Uh, this required us to, to perform a pivot as well within the organization in identifying people uh, that would be able to speak to different topics and, and it was really exciting for us uh, because people responded very quickly. Um, everyone, everyone wanted to, to support uh, those who were moving from traditional face-to-face -face, uh, education into an online environment. So, so these, these webinars were, were really to provide practical uh, ideas, practical suggestions, practical guidance for how to uh, survive and, and to really succeed in the online environment. Um, and this was, as I said, focusing on the day-to-day -day challenges that educators face. There were 11 webinars all together leading up to the, um, the, the Eden Conference. We had over 3,500 participants worldwide, over 120 countries. And what was really interesting, we also had over 9,100 views of the recordings. And so people were not just engaging synchronously, but they were also engaging asynchronously. Next slide. After the Eden conference, um, we sat down to talk about, well, how do we want to move forward with the current uh, webinar series? And, and we decided that we wanted to kind of reframe it, re rename it. Uh, and so we called it the Eden, uh, the Eden Initiative Education and Time of the New Normal. Uh, how, what are the issues that, that we have to address? What are the things that we really need to deal with? And these were things on a, on a really high leadership level, you know, in terms of, you know, how can we strategize? What kinds of leadership issues um, uh, are we facing? How can we transform our institutions to, you know, really adapt to this new normal? Uh, and then we went into a little bit more of the, you know, how do we create communities of support for our teachers? What can we do within the organization to support them and to support our students? And we ended with the digital education action plan from the EU, uh, setting education and training uh, for the digital age, um, having them come and present this plan, uh, which had a, a number of, of, of attendees. Uh, there were over 1,064 views of the recordings, 800 participants, and and just so many speakers, 26 speakers and moderators. Uh, and uh, yeah, and that led up to our research workshop in the, um, in the fall. Next slide, please. Um, we had a number of different con con uh, conference activities. Uh, as we were talking about before this session started, Eden made the decision very, very quickly uh, to shift to online, to move our conference into the online environment, which was, which was very challenging. But despite the challenges of moving it into the online environment, we still had 309 participants from over 40 countries. Uh, there were 511 uh, live streams, four web streamed pl plenary sessions where anyone could attend uh, by watching YouTube sessions, 44 pa papers, 12 workshops, a synergy session, which included eight different projects, 11 posters, 
uh, two demonstrations, and all of the conference proceedings were published electronically. So even though we had to pivot ourselves very quickly uh, to moving into a virtual online conference, I think we did this quite successfully. Next slide. From the lessons that we learned from the annual conference, we were able to apply these within the research workshop and to really expand upon our virtual presence even more. Here we had about 200 participants present from 43 countries. Again, we, we streamed our plenary sessions uh, live and free to the public over YouTube and had 48 pa paper presentations, seven workshops, 16 posters, and there was also, which is uh, an integral part of all of our research workshops, a PhD symposium uh, where 14 PhD students presented their, their um, the status of their, of their PhDs and then received feedback. We also had a very rambunctious Oxford style debate and uh, round, round table discussions. Next slide. And now I'd like to pass this back to Sandra. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. So um, you see, you see that we did a number of activities online. Actually, uh, this is my first year of presidency, and I can tell you that I was quite scared how to do it online. Uh, so much challenges, you know. I thought it would be so easy to take over the my colleague Irina, as she did very well. Uh, and when I came, I thought, okay, now it's going to be smooth, easy, nice time. And then we had the COVID, and we had the Brexit, and things like that. And so I, I wasn't sure how we are going to do it. That, but nevertheless, it just showed that we are quite strong community. And this is the team effort, and this is why we did so well. And um, uh, also what we did is that we joined the uh, uh, UNESCO uh, COVID-19 Global Education Coalition because all we are doing is uh, open, is free, and uh, it is there to help uh, the uh, education community to use all we produce, uh, all this expertise we produce uh, in way to enhance uh, the, the education and uh, everything they need at, at the moment. So we were very happy to become uh, the member of uh, UNESCO uh, initiative. And for the, our last slide, Tim, uh, yeah, I just uh, put in, in one slide uh, the resources which are there available uh, and I'm certain that uh, they can be of uh, good uh, use. Uh, so we have Eden Web where you can find that all our sessions uh, are recorded and available, uh, meaning uh, the webinars, the, the proceedings for the annual conferences and research workshops. We have the Eurodl, European Journal of Open Distance and E-Learning, so it is also uh, available. We have monthly newsletters, we have blogs and even YouTube channel where we publish uh, all uh, the session. So uh, definitely a number of resources. And I'm very happy to see that, for example, in the time when the, the COVID struck, and I have to say that uh, Croatia, Croatia experienced quite heavily her earthquake in March uh, this year in Zagreb. So in all these... Uh, uh, situations uh, which were quite hard uh, for us. Uh, when I shared the information that Eden uh, is doing something uh, and it is there to help uh, people in everyday situation uh, in education, uh, lots of uh, lots of people from Croatia joined, and I think that was a very good way to see how such organization uh, as Eden can help the educators worldwide. So this is our first part. So Tim, we are back to you. Thank you very much, Sandra, Elisa. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand over to, to Rhonda. If you can give us an introduction of the USDLA, please. So actually, um, we're going to hand it over to Reggie. Reggie's going to start it, then I will follow up. Please. All right. Well, uh, welcome, everyone. And um, <clears throat> here in the States, my name is Reggie Smith. Uh, on behalf of the United States Distance Learning Association and really um, enjoying the opportunity to, to have a chance to talk to everyone in a worldwide audience uh, with Eden and our partners. And so the association, it was, it was interesting as we had a discussion prior to this webinar on the, now the entire world is connected in a space that we have expertise, many, many, many years of expertise and research backing the the value um, and the rigor 
behind online and distance education. And so the association was the first uh, US formed association here in the United States in 1987. Uh, we have members, we have national members and we also have state chapters. And so every state does a little something different, a little different flavor. And so they are really on the, uh, on the ground and the grassroots. And so for example, our Texas chapter uh, has a wonderful online accessibility program. Accessibility came up as a big item uh, when COVID hit. And so leveraging those state chapters. We also have, uh, we also publish a journal, newsletter, blogs, uh, and anything else. And so we have a ton of research and, and I will defer to Rhonda on some of the COVID response, but one of the things that we did do really fast was stand up a web page on our site with a lot of resources dealing with uh, COVID, the one question that was quite interesting as schools and institutions reached out, where did all this new stuff come from? And I said, a lot of this stuff is, it, there's new stuff, but there's 30, 40 years of stuff. And so we just repositioned it so we make sure that you can find it. And so we have been here and we will be here uh, to come, but I'll pass it to Rhonda to really go into our response on the uh, pandemic and what she's been really kind of spearheading. Thank you, Reggie. Yeah, um, I think just like Sandra, when I became president of USDLA, um, I never anticipated that we would go into something called COVID. I don't know. Um, and having to switch and 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 change everything. Um, one of the things, just like Eden did, at the moment that um, we went to shut down in the U.S. Um, in March, we started a Friday webinar series. And that Friday webinar series was looking at distance learning resources. How can you get started quickly and, and pivot if you need to? Um, and we have continued those Friday webinar series all the way into today. Um, every Friday, we still have a webinar. Um, one of the things with USDLA is that we look at all different constituencies. So obviously we have higher ed and K-12, but we also have corporate, nonprofit, military government, um, homeschooling. I mean, there's so many different constituencies that deals with distance learning or distance training. And so we really try to focus our webinars on different parts of our constituencies to make sure that they're getting what they need. And like Reggie said, um, along with that, we post all of our recordings onto um, our webpage um, and any resources that that particular person had that did the webinar, the panel. And we put those together so people can very quickly find them, along with all the other resources that people submit to us and we find and we restructured a little bit just so people can find things that they need. Um, a couple of other things that we um, wanted to focus on was, you know, the people that didn't have access. What did that look like? Um, and though we knew about that going into um, the pandemic that there were lots of people in the U.S. or around the world that don't have access, and but it really came to um, awareness at that time. And so we had um, an, an HBCU, um, Historically Black Colleges and Universities Forum um, in May um, to really kind of help those schools address trying to pivot and move and go online and help their students. But this fall, we also had a legislative forum to really focus on um, broadband and equities um, across everywhere. There are times that you're like, oh, but you can get on the internet. Oh, no, you can't because you're in the middle of nowhere or you don't have um, internet at home or whatever the case is, um, really trying to focus on that. Um, just like Eden, we had, we always have our face-to-face -face conference in like the May timeframe and we had to not have it face-to-face -face because it was in Nashville and Nashville was shut down at the time. And so we moved to July. So we had like two months and I am, I'm sure everyone on this panel is probably going, yes, we, we understand that <laughs> had to move everything online to an online conference. We had 285 participants at that conference. Um, and we had, um, sessions, but those sessions were very targeted. We went through all the different sessions that were supposed to be at the original conference. And we, um, had some of them that were perfect 
go ahead and do those, but others that were like, hey, can you redo this a little bit and make it a little bit more relevant for what's going on right now? And so being able to work with those presenters, make sure that was happening. Um, but we not only did we have the sessions, but we also had um, keynotes to really help people understand um, how to find those resources. So how do you find educational, re um, open educational resources when you're not sure where to go? Um, so we had a panel or we had a keynote on that and really trying to help people find where they were going. But we also had networking times. And so how can you know who to reach out to? Um, and that's one of the things that USDLA prides itself on is being able to help people find those networks and really to be able to do that. One of the, a couple of the other things um, that we did, um, obviously with National Distance Learning Week in the U.S. is next week, and um, we're going to hopefully address some of those issues that people are still facing. And um, But we also are looking at putting together a student survey where are students right now? How are they feeling? You know, all the way from social, social, emotional, which amazes me that people are saying, oh, people need social, emotional help now. Um, and it's actually, they probably always have, um, and, but really trying to focus on where are the students right now and what are they facing um, to make sure that um, we address that and get that information out there. So those are some of the things that we've been doing to help address um, people having to go into online learning very quickly. Um, and I think Marcy is um, our next one and is gonna kind of follow up with all of that. Thank you, Rhonda, it helps when you unmute. So you can see how fantastic Eden, Eden and USDLA have risen to the challenge. And part of what is most near and dear to my heart, having been former president and chair emeritus of the U.S. Distance Learning Association, as well as a blessing of being installed as an Eden Fellow, along with uh, Sandra, president of Eden, at the same time back almost a decade ago, um, the blessing has been that we realize it's a global uh, need. It's a global movement. And we've been there, as you can see, for 20, 30 more plus years. Um, but that collective, collaborative spirit that has been among the global institutions, even the European Distance Learning Week that uh, we've started together with, with the National Distance Learning Week in the U.S. and then became the European Distance Learning Week as another one. And then Mark will talk to you in a moment about what's going down on down under. The point is that another great benefit of joining any of these associations is that global presence and understanding all of us, many of us have international students. Many of us serve constituencies worldwide in various areas. And so that collaborative um, expertise and sharing, networking, is such a great value for these organizations, for whether you're a member of USDLA, Eden, ODLA, uh, in plan, uh, in Plans, New Zealand. I'll let Mark clear that up. ICDE or any of the other organizations is that you're going to see the same people networking and sharing and growing off of each other professionally. Uh, we were talking just a little bit earlier about Don Alcott, who has been a major mover in each one of these organizations uh, because he's so global. And so we're all connected and we're thrilled to be part of the family. So I'm glad that all of you are on and that you can see all these valuable resources and that you'll be able to share them across your networks throughout your country and throughout your sphere of influence. Uh, with that, I'm just going to say um, thank you to Eden for having USDLA on and to Lisa Marie for running the Eden Camp Fellow Council, for getting to be a part of that and to share. Um, there's just a lot of love in this family and a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Wanda, Reggie, and, and Marcy. That was, uh, that was very good. Very, uh, 
very positive and full of uh, information. Okay, Mark, over to you. Can you uh, give us the down under perspective? You have to un unmute. I'm muted. I'm unmuted, am I? By the look of it, yes. Well, I did just put a few slides together um, because I'm sort of wearing more than one hat here, actually too many hats to know which one I should be talking from. Um, I really just wanted to give you a little bit of an insight into the experience um, down under, as we would say it. Um, I'm actually a New Zealander, but I'm living in Dublin in Ireland and uh, a member of the executive of Eden, just to kind of show you the, the different hats. I did want to just kind of put into context, I'm sure we've all seen these sorts of um, stats from UNESCO or other agencies, the scale of what we were facing. Um, this particular slide comes back from April, and of course, not a lot has really changed, certainly in, in Europe. Um, what's interesting is um, in the matter of the first day, really, of shutdown in Ireland and pretty much across all of Europe, we joined with Eden, the, the group that I um, lead, the National Institute for Digital Learning in Ireland, with Eden and also the European Association for Distance Teaching Universities to offer a webinar on the first Monday. Um, somewhat overwhelmed by, by the demand, um, some European countries were just going into lockdown. And at the very same time, the reason I just wanted to show you this slide was again, to indicate the level of demand that we are still dealing with or trying to uh, respond to. Um, within 10 days of that webinar, um, we put together this course, um, a number of FutureLearn partners on a MOOC. You'll see over 85,000 educators around the world um, participated in that MOOC. And we all know MOOC completion rates are an issue, but around 25% completed that course. Um, and then I just wanted to alert you to the fact that since we are taking a global perspective, this is one of a handful of publications that have come out now. This particular one has 30 case studies from around the world that came out back in, I think it was around June. So these are going to obviously be historical in time to come, but useful to be aware of. And then before I switch down under, I think it's useful for us because we've already mentioned how these professional bodies that we represent have got a wealth of experience built up over um, decades, not just years, but decades, actually. But looking into the future, the demand for higher education is not going to get any less. And so beyond COVID-19, um, we need to be thinking about the role that professional bodies can play. And this is just back of the envelope calculations here. But if you can see this slide, it's estimated by 2050, there will be another billion, I'll round it up, um, post-secondary learners that we need to cope with. Well, if we were to build one new university every day, one every day, every week, for 365 days a year, um, for the next 30 years, calculated on 30,000 students in a university, that's still only going to give us about 330,000 million students capacity. So there is no way that we are going to be able to meet the demand currently um, with the bricks and mortar type solutions that people might want to return to and long to return to post COVID-19. So it's not that we're just um, dealing with a problem right now and responding to a crisis. This is something we have to think about beyond COVID. So switching down under, and if you can see this, actually um, those of us who come from down under tend to think that we look at the world the other way around and everyone else is down under. Um, this is how the world map should really be. I want to just touch on briefly um, the two associations that I've been involved in and continue to have some association with um, and how they responded. Firstly, Odla. Odla has a very long history. Um, over 40 years, it's been publishing the Journal of um, Distance Education over that period for 40 plus years. Um, and this is the first year that Odla, in a partnership with Flans, whom I'm going to talk about shortly, have launched what we're calling in the inaugural Australasian Online and Distance Learning Week to coincide and work 
in partnership with Eden and also the US body. So um, we're delighted to be able to be part of um, the events over the course of this week. I happen to be an executive member, committee member of Odla, so that's how I'm wearing those different hats. Um, we're a much smaller um, professional body and it's hard to um, really put into context given the scale of what Eden did in particular from my knowledge. Um, the, the size down under isn't quite the same, although the importance of distance and online learning is just as important given the geographical distances and locations. Um, I've mentioned distance education because distance education is one of the highest ranked journals in the field. Um, it's a Q1 journal still, and distance education has produced a special issue. Um, a couple of articles just um, on the slides here to give you a taste. Some of you will be well familiar with those two authors, Curtis Bonk, um, in the, on this last one. Um, distance Ed then hosted a webinar just a few weeks ago on this special issue. So Odler, by and large, has really tried to tap into its existing community and through its existing publications. Um, we did have a webinar this morning, very early, 7 a.m. this morning, my time, because I moderated that webinar um, about 6 o'clock um, in Melbourne or Australia, in uh, Sydney. And uh, anyone who knows um, Australia in particular, today is known as the day that stops a nation. It's the race that stops the nation because it's the day of the Melbourne Cup, a uh, very famous horse race, the most famous horse race, a bit like the Kentucky Derby. And uh, first time, I think, in its history that the horses raced with no people in the stadium. Um, moving to Flans, um, Flans is very much um, similar to Odler, um, it has a long history. It actually used to be called DEANS, the Distance Education Association of New Zealand. Uh, many moons ago, I used to be president of that association. And um, Flans looks after a small community of New Zealand educators. It has quite a strong institutional membership. Most of the universities are institutional members. Similarly, it publishes the Journal of um, Open, Flexible and Distance Learning. So if you're looking for somewhere to publish your work, it has um, a high quality editorial board from around the world. And like other professional bodies, um, it's produced a special issue related to COVID-19. The situation in Australia and New Zealand, an interesting, I think, experience, and I should generalise this more to Southern Hemisphere countries, where the academic calendar is different from the Northern Hemisphere, that in itself had quite a bearing on the challenges that faced universities. In Australia and New Zealand in particular, the crisis really came in at a time when international students were about to arrive in the country. And um, that really challenged the higher education systems uh, in good and bad ways, to be truthful, because in Australia and New Zealand, international students generated a very large amount of revenue for universities. And that really cut off a revenue stream. Um, so they were really starting their new academic year, whereas um, here in Europe, we were already well into the academic year, in fact, entering the second semester. Um, so I think they had a very big bearing on how we responded in the sort of academic life cycle. Um, in the case of um, Flans, just a little advertisement for the webinar that they are offering on Friday. Um, time zones are a challenge here, but as we saw from the statistics, the figures from Eden, the uptake of the recorded webinars, the echo from this, I think is something we shouldn't underestimate. And hopefully that's a case of um, this week's activities as well. And then I thought I'd just end somewhat hopefully on the note that, you know, New Zealand's a great place to go. Um, it's the home of the Lord of the Rings and all the other um, wonderful things that are good from down under. And Flans is offering its conference in April 2021. Maybe we'll be allowed on a plane by that stage. So if you've got some professional development money you haven't spent, perhaps you should place um, this conference on your to-do list. Actually, I have one last slide, which is slightly um, self-promotional. I think one of the other takeaways, we've heard about the importance of emotion. Um, we're hearing about the pedagogy of care, uh, 
um, the importance of the affect of the side to learning that has come out. And it's not something that's new again, but I think it's certainly been raised, raised in profile. My own university, um, and with some special COVID-19 funding, and we're now actually collaborating with Eden with, fingers crossed, a European Commission Erasmus application, um, basically to support learners to learn how to learn online. So this particular course, we got up and running quite quickly. It was offered uh, about a month ago. 5,000 um, learners participated in this course. Over 50% completed the course, which I think is evidence of um, the success of the way that we, in particular, had a course that was designed for learners, by learners, with learners, students, co-facilitating and co-designing the course. But I'm just flagging this to us because we often are talking to our um, colleagues as educators, but I think we also need to be reaching out more to our learners and the professional bodies that represent learners, European Student Association, in institutional student associations and the like. So I'll stop on that note. Um, kia ora is what we would say in New Zealand, and I'm not going to give a bad Irish um, for thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. That was, uh, you did a, a great job on that. Okay, so we're moving over to the, uh, the discussion part of uh, the event. What I'm going to do is um, ask a question and I'll ask it to one of you from one association and then I'll leave it open at the end in case anybody wants to add, add anything uh, to what your colleagues have uh, said. I think you've given us an absolutely amazing perspective of your institutions. I think you've, uh, you, we have all been doing a, a, a good and impressive uh, um, a matter of work there. So I guess the first uh, question really is about um, expectations and how they meet with reality, because they, they often say that be careful what you wish for, because it might come true. And I sometimes get the feeling talking to people in, in, in higher ed and, and in professional industrial roles that they they kind of think they like to have a more visible um, role in, in shaping society and um, the way things work. Now, the pandemic has come along. It's not something we would have chosen for a lot of reasons, but it certainly thrust us into the limelight. So what I'd like to, to really ask you is um, what's your kind of your reflections on how this has changed? You know, what you were doing before the pandemic, what you're doing now? Um, how is this process of adapting to the change actually gone? And, and, and how you see your association uh, responding once we go back or go on to new normal? And uh, let me start with Rhonda, please. Um, so I think some of the things that we do now are things, one, we should have been doing all along, but I think what's come out of it is the awareness of what's not happening. And so being able to really see that, that kind of we were talking, I was talking about earlier that broadband inequity across different areas, you know, who doesn't have access when you're going to school, you're, you're going into a building. Sometimes that is not obvious that people go home and they don't have access or, um, and it's not just in the K-12 or higher ed, it could also be, you know, corporate people that are now working remotely or they're supposed to be working remotely, but they don't have great access. And so I think that that's part of it. The awareness of what is not happening, I think is coming out more. So, you know, I hear all the time, especially in the K-12 arena of this shift to having everyone being able to be online. Many of the states inside the United States made all of their students and their entire school district do online for the first like month. And, you know, that brought out the idea that what does it mean to be isolated from people? I mean, all of a sudden, yes, we've, we thought about kind of, we were talking about social emotional learning, but what does it mean to really be isolated? Can you, you know, what does it mean that if people don't turn on their cameras or have to, or, you know, what is the etiquette of being online? So I think there are some things that we're finding as we're going through this, that 
we probably knew in the back of our head, at least we did, but I think the rest of the world is starting to realize there are things that we haven't thought about that we need to be thinking about. Um, Because when someone goes into quarantine, what do they have to do? Well, they have to be online. And if they're walking into a school one day and the next day they're not, what does that mean? And how do they shift that? So I think there is a lot of um, things that we need to still figure out and help them. And so as associations, being able to put out, if it's a webinar, if it's a recording of a webinar, if it's the resource to say, this is how you need to get your students online. This is best practices. This is how you engage. I mean, these are things that we've known about for years, but people haven't thought about them. And I think that that's just something that we need. I think we've been trying to help them with this, really giving those resources to them. But I think that's going to continue to go as as we still deal with this every day. That's a great answer, Rhonda. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sandra, would you like to come in now? Yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I would I would just say uh, that Reggie and Rhonda already said we have been doing things for for a number of years, uh, but I would say that now we uh, somehow become much more appreciated in our work because uh, that expertise and knowledge we had we had it thirty years ago as well, but. Um, we were more uh, seen as uh, exotic institutions doing something online, you know, like in like a hobby, uh, mostly. Uh, because uh, in Europe, there are still a number of countries who think that traditional teaching and learning is something which is real and should stay as it is. And that online is, okay, here, it is here and it will go somehow, but uh, it hasn't, uh, it's, it's still here. But now I think that uh, in the time when this pandemic struck, uh, we realized that collaboration is much more important now. Uh, we now appreciate much more uh, this online collaboration because we cannot go anymore uh, to conferences, uh, to meet with friends, uh, to talk about issues. So now we much more appreciate collaboration. And I think in this time, it is very important. And this is uh, our role to gather people, to, to enable this networking um, and the sharing of expertise and practice also, all our expertise we have, we, we have to now uh, present it in, a, in another way and offer uh, to people. They are needed it because somehow we are taking the role of, I would say, trainers uh, of the educators, training the trainers, you know, because uh, in higher education, uh, the, the training is not compulsory. So it, depending on the teachers, mostly if they would like or not to do it. And somehow now teachers are looking at us as associations to, to get this uh, information, how to do something uh, as, 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 a point, as a focal point where they can find uh, information. Um, uh, I think that uh, it is very good that such association as USDLA, as even as uh, ODLA, ICD, and ERDTU are existing because now it's their time. Now this is our moment. This is our five minutes of glory because we have been waiting for this for 30 years, you know, that something happened and we needed COVID that things actually happened. So let's take all the benefits, all the advantages of, of, of this situation and help people to shape the education in the way they want it to be in the 21st century. And it doesn't not necessarily mean sitting in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. That was a great answer as well. Um, okay, Mark, over to you. Well, one, uh, I think, uh, segue from uh, Sandra's last comment is uh, our contribution might not just be to other educators, but our contribution not just to other educators, but policymakers, um, leaders and policymakers. Uh, here in Europe, um, we're pleased to have been able to make submissions to quite a sizable fund, a COVID-19 uh, response fund uh, for digital education that also links into the Digital Education Action Plan 2021 to 2027, I think it is, which was only just released about a month ago. So um, for me, I think the independence that the professional bodies bring um, in sifting through 
what I put in uh, the chat box there, the fact that there are people now who claim expertise in online learning that I don't necessarily think I would be listening to. And I'm sure those of us who have had a long history in the area do know that we've learned quite a lot from the research over the years. But yet we are still seeing questions like, well, is online just as good as face-to-face? -face? Um, can we go back to face-to-face because -face it's so much better? These are questions that have been answered well and truly in the past. And um, I think we have a role to play to nudge the policymakers. And by implication, that means the educational leaders in a direction more akin to what I was trying to capture in that if we take a far sight horizon beyond COVID-19, online has to be part of, online distance, open solutions have to be part of the new global higher education ecosystem. Thanks, Mark. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't agree more with what you were saying. Would anybody else like to add anything to, to this question or to what our colleagues have said? This is, this is uh, Reggie from uh, USDLA. I, I, I do, and it's wonderful to be here with all the, all the colleagues. I, uh, now that everyone is an expert, I think, uh, Mark, you noted that uh, in, in the field, uh, I think we have to, you know, we found that we've had to try to balance that. You know, the K-12 school systems just threw everybody on Google and Zoom and said, uh, this is distance learning. And, and, and sometimes you look, I have a third grader and looking at the class and the kids, are, you know, and, and really kind of going face to face with the school systems and the, and the higher ed here in the States to <clears throat> provide the evidence that there is a better way than just trying to cut and paste the traditional classroom into an online environment and keep kids in, in school from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so, we also see see that, and also I heard you talk about the policy piece. That's why we pushed out. Rhonda mentioned the policy form. Um, I somewhat think this, you know, out of a boom of distance education and some misusing and throwing everything onto a video, we may have some bad policy. So we will have to be engaged on a global scale to push back with the evidence that we have built over you know many of our careers. And so uh, this is this is our moment and to really kind of push forward online education and hopefully rebalance the entire planet to do it right. Thanks, Reggie. Um, we have got some questions coming in in the Q&A tool. Thank you. I'll start to use those in a minute. But I want to make uh, the most of um, the, the answers you've, um, you've given to the first question. Now, perhaps to take the Take the boxing gloves off and ask you a more intense question. And uh, I think I'm going to I'm going to ask you this question first, Marcy. I'm warning you. Okay, I'm being nice now. <laughs> um, okay, I mean maybe it made sense. Uh, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago, to have individual associations because in our countries we're probably printing paper and putting them into envelopes and posting them out. But we can see that's not the case anymore. We're a globalized society. Do you think it makes sense to have individual um, associations like this, or should we all get together and be a global association? Marcy, would you like to start, please? I would love to. Um, there is power in individual associations and in global organizations. Uh, what we have found, you know, I'm a futurist, so I look out at education throughout the world and what the trends are, et cetera. And what I see is that every region of the world has their own, we have our own commonality globally, but we all have our own individual personality, our own individual needs. Uh, it's like Sir John Daniel, who's a member of, of Eden, USDLA, and several other organizations. He once, he you know, started the UK um, Open University, and, and he was brought over to the United States to start, see if he could do open universities across the US. And what he found appalled him because you have to work with 50 states. That's like working with 50 countries, everyone having their own rules and needs. And he said it was not anything like, it was easy to do it in Europe because uh, there's such a European Union and a collection of, of joint, uh, joint, you know, priorities. Um, and so the answer to your question is that there's such individualism among countries and among nations, among regions of the world, that these individual organizations are priceless. But at the same time, 
the true power comes when we all collaborate and we get together and have one voice with all our experience and our individualism of understanding what does the global picture look like and then how does that impact each individual region of the world. So that's why I think we're doing the right thing. Wonderful answer. I, must, I, quite, I quite agree with you there. I'm sure I should have expressed my opinion, but I do anyway. Okay, uh, Lisa, what do you think? Well, I don't particularly agree with Marcy that the European Union uh, doesn't have its own individualism because I think that they're, each of the states have uh, their own context as well and each of them have their own educational goals and not everyone is on the same page. So I think we're in a lot of ways like the, the United States in terms of having, you know, each country has its own context. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought up context because context is really so important. And within our organizations, we put forward that specific context or we try to address that specific context. I mean, this is why this is European Distance Learning Week is, is to really look at some of the issues that are that are affecting Europe and how we met, might best uh, uh, deal with those. Uh, the other thing that I think is important um, for especially for the Eden organization is we have a very, very strong tradition and history that's based within research. And so the work that we've done has traditionally been in the area of, of you know, publishing research, putting that focus on, on developing students and, and developing um, young researchers uh, to, to really contribute to the field of online and distance learning and also to influence policy uh, through our involvement in different European Union projects. So I think, um, like you said, Marcy, it's really, really important to, that we bring our individual context, but also then to look at how can we work at these, at these global problems um, together. And I think, I think we're doing a good job of that, but I think there's also opportunities for improvement. Thanks, Lisa. I also completely agree. I think this um, follows on from Mark's previous comment that um, there's a lot of people out there saying a lot of things, and you're saying, "Oh, there's a, a talk by these experts," and you look at you look at them and think, "Hmm, I, not names that ring a bell." So, if you want to know if somebody's uh, worth listening to, look at their look at their published research. I think that helps enormously. Okay, Mark. So, can I come back to you, please? Remind me what the question is. The question I've already forgotten this. I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. It's um, does it still make sense for us to be individual associations at this stage in the game? Thank you. Often I say the question is the answer. So, um, what probably that's a nice segue to is you know um, when I uh, started the week yesterday, I put out a little tweet because I realised over the weekend that it was precisely to the day one year ago since we hosted here in Dublin, the ICD World Conference on Online Learning. Um, now, whilst not everyone uh, was able to be in attendance, we did have over 800 from uh, 80 countries and we had representatives from, I think, all the professional bodies here today. Um, and so for me, um, if you want to borrow from George Siemens and Co's um, connectivist theory, knowledge is in the network. Um, there's no one body that can hold all the knowledge, can not only hold it or distill it, but actually generate that new knowledge. But at the same time, as I think Lisa and Marcy were teasing out, um, education is a contextual activity. And that's why the, um, particularly in New Zealand and Australia, um, I'm probably going to uh, talk as a New Zealander here. I wouldn't want to talk on behalf of my Australian cousins, but um, New Zealand is a country that's fiercely independent and um, also very mindful of its heritage and culture in a globalized world. And there are forces at work in higher education in particular that are utilizing new technologies to develop global marketplaces. Um, and online is part of that. So I think our professional bodies have a role here to critique and challenge, and again, to educate maybe our policymakers about what might be happening because um, innovation in online education is not entirely neutral or benign. Um, so I think that's another aspect to this. But I do know that um, the professional body of Blands and Odler without the connections to Eden, the US body and other networks, they would feel incredibly isolated. Um, and so it's a very powerful community to be part of. 
I quite agree. It's global, isn't it? Global, global, but local. I think that's uh, that's good. Okay, would anybody else like to add anything here? I seen the jump rope uh, first all the time, right? <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I see the balance here. I, I think the beauty is in the network. It's almost like a highway system. We have, uh, and 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 recognizing the individuality of each of the countries in the culture and the context is important. But also putting that highway in in place here in the states. We one of our sponsors, uh, NC Sarah has a very good model that they use to deal with state reciprocity across the state borders and how institutions work with each other to really recognize those uh, degrees and institutions and credits to the benefits of the students. And so it, it, it is a benefit for all of us to come together, but also recognize the individual uh, status. Texas, our chapter, Marcy and, and Rhonda, very strong chapter. Uh, very individual, but as a collective with USDLA work together. So I think there are common threads that we all can work together and also have some fun in a post-pandemic world. Indeed. Thanks, Reggie. And you're always welcome to jump in whenever you, whenever you want to. Um, I'm aware of the time that um, this is uh, the schedule end point, but I think we're going to keep this going for another 15 minutes or so because it's, we're just beginning to, to pick up some pace here and there's still lots of questions coming in. So precisely that. Um, Anna Alfonso asked a question in the, the Q&A tool here, which I think goes back to what happened at the beginning of the, uh, the first uh, lockdown. I mean, the, a lot of face-to-face -face education, specifically at schools, had to close. They went into emergency remote learning mode. Um, I think also they weren't necessarily supported as much institutionally as they as they could have been. And um, I think this, in a way, leaked over on onto us. I remember when we were getting the online together webinars going, we were being contacted by a lot of people in that situation, and they were, were having a hard time of it, and they didn't really know what to do. And uh, I think they did a great job, really. So the question here is, what's your experience of this? Have you got any particular anecdotes about that that you'd like to, to share with us? And um, OK, so can we start with Sandra, please? Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yes, uh, I can share stories from Croatia, but I'm not certain that people would like to, to hear <laughs> hear them because mostly higher education institutions in Croatia would like to stay on face-to-face -face, uh, uh, teaching and learning. We are quite traditional in that way. But um, anyway, uh, for example, for this academic year, for the full semester, uh, the uh, National Agency for Science, uh, Education and Technology said that the best way for teaching and learning should be in the classroom and that everyone should come back to the classroom. Uh, and this is, this is that message actually and uh, that this uh, enables uh, young people to become full citizens uh, being in the classroom and now with the pandemic rising in Croatia uh, the, the, the more and more schools are closing because uh, the, the COVID infected children and teachers. Uh, now we have a situation that uh, high education institutions said, okay, you have to be prepared for fully online. So how <laughs> in, in one month <laughs> can we change the policies? Uh, it's not possible, but um, some uh, wise high education institutions have been working for a whole summer in preparation uh, for the autumn uh, uh, regarding the teacher, regarding the infrastructure, structure regarding the policies and now they are doing quite well others are, are, are in i would say in, in not so good position uh, of trying to organize online teaching and learning and what reggie said just pushing pushing uh, classroom uh, uh, teaching uh, into online environment is not online education and more and more students are saying that they don't like this experience and also we have to think that online and distance education, which has uh, its uh, uh, its significance, uh, its tradition, are uh, now somehow endangered by the way bad way of using uh, these terms uh, uh, and using uh, it for teaching uh, and learning. So just pushing um, everyday classroom teaching in online environment is not online uh, teaching and learning. And this is why here uh, association as ours. Uh, can have important role in showing uh, what are the good examples, how things should be done. And I think that is, for Eden is very good that we have this coalition, uh, this good collaboration with European Commission, 
uh, and that uh, we can enhance their messages uh, uh, to the uh, European Union countries uh, regarding the uh, online and distance education. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, um, Rhonda. So I, I, as Sandra was talking after the question, I, I mean, all of these examples went through my head and, you know, one was my son. He is in graduate school at one of the universities, in te universities here in Texas, and he actually works at the REC um, there on campus, the recreation center on campus. And um, he then um, got exposed. Now, he never got COVID, but he got exposed. So he had to be quarantined for two weeks. And so he didn't get to go to class. He didn't um, get to go to work. He had to stay in his apartment. He lives alone. And by the second week, he was calling us every single day just to have someone to talk to. And so, you know, one of the things I think that is happening is, is more than just can we get education where we need it to go? Because I don't think we they have in many situations. But how can we also support our students? So part of at the university level is not just educating, but supporting, right? And I don't think we've even breached how to support our students very well when it comes to if the students need to be quarantined for two weeks and they're all alone in their apartment, what are we, what are we doing? Are we reaching out to them? Is there a way to create, I mean, I know we're all zoomed out, but is there a way to create some way for them to be talking to others and and being part of something. Um, I know that many universities here in Texas, especially in Texas, um, we love our football, American football. And um, but so many of the the teams have gotten quarantined, and that shuts down a whole segment of. Um, the university because they're touching so many people, right? It's that contact tracing. And, and so I think that the idea that, you know, yes, education can definitely be done online and it can be done just as well. And we're facing that and faculty not understanding how to do that very well with all of our support. But I also think that um, we, we need to think about that support side too. Um, there is statistics out there right now, at least in the U.S., that um, the number of students trying to commit suicide in a year has already happened in the first two months of school. And that is astonishing. And so I think there's more beyond just can we get them in the classroom and making sure we're teaching them, but are we also supporting them in a way that they can flourish and still learn? Because if they're not, you know, if they're not healthy mentally, they're not going to be able to learn. It just, we just, we, there's so many things we need to address when it comes to that, when it comes to the pandemic beyond just, um, just the education part of it. I, I didn't mean to put a downer on that part, <laughs> you know. That's uh, fine, Rhonda, don't worry. I must admit, as a, as a teacher and also a parent, I've lived both sides of the, of the question with three kids, one in school and two in university. It's been an interesting experience, shall we, shall we say. Okay, Mark, I saw you nodding at a lot of what Rhonda was saying. Do you want to come in here? Well, this is a very uh, dear to heart conversation in that the one of the motivations for the course that I showed right at the end, the free MOOC on um, learning how to learn online, it actually was funded by some special COVID-19 um, research money we had with um, the focus on learner emotions. And uh, we were involved in a, a survey, a global survey of educators' emotions, because I think that's another lesson. Uh, we, we've all gone through roller coaster rides up and down but if we've been doing that, think about the learners. So it was quite um, a really powerful takeaway um, in the start of the MOOC because there's a research dimension to it, um, but also because we wanted to begin where the learners are, we asked them, how are you feeling? Um, and if I had time, I'd bring up the, the graph that shows or the figure that shows how they were feeling 
95% said they were anxious. They were feeling uncomfortable. Um, even people who had already been studying, so not just first year students making a transition from school, um, but experienced seasoned postgraduate learners in, in the course. Uh, so that really showed us that um, the emotional side of learning, the effective side of learning was something we needed to take a lot more note of. And as I touched on in this particular course, we employed a group of students to be the co-facilitators and we also reached out through the Irish Universities Association to have a group of students help us in the design of the course. And there was a degree of emptiness. We designed quite deliberately for emptiness because it's almost an oxymoron to think that an institution really knows the challenges that a learner faces um, or even our educators know. So when we asked and reached for the, out for the learners to tell us what their problems are, but also the solutions for their problems, um, it just showed me how out of touch I personally was and many of my colleagues, if you like, and in a good way in that we were at least opening ourselves up to the fact that if we're willing to reach out to our learners, they actually have many good suggestions and ideas um, for that they can support themselves. Not that that is an excuse for us not to also be playing a role, but actually some of the suggestions they came up with we would just never have um, considered ourselves. So I think the power of the community, and if we want to link that back into, say, the community of inquiry framework that many of us um, cite and, and over now more than 20 years has been one of the defining theoretical frameworks, I think it would be fair to say that emotion presence has not been something that's been particularly profiled um, to this time. Thanks, Mark. I think you're right. I think uh, we've had another a question here spontaneously emerging in the uh, discussion that of, uh, of support and the importance for, uh, for our students. So I'd like you just to move on with this. So Marcy, can I ask you for your opinion on this? Yes, I was thinking about how important support was, <clears throat> not only from an equity side of making sure they have everything they need and the social and emotional side, but also for all of us that teach online <clears throat> and the, you know, many, many of us were thrust into working remotely and we're not used to doing that. Some people like those on this call that have taught for UMUC and many other institutions that have been doing it online, uh, not from an office. And then sometimes from an office, it wasn't as big an adjustment. But when you look at that, social, social, uh, that socioeconomic, uh, not socioeconomic, that's a whole nother story of the making sure the have nots have, um, but that the social and emotional side of things for the educator, um, we, not just the learner, but that what does it mean to work remotely? How do we feel overcome our isolation? Uh, what support do we have as educators among each other uh, and, and so forth? I think Eden's already done a webinar a little bit about this uh, and, and USDLA is getting ready to have a one in December on it. But that, I think that's another part of supporting the learner and supporting the educator, not only from a how do I teach online and I love Mark that you guys already have a course that's designed towards that and we have that accessibility course that USDLA or TXDLA has designed and some of those things are being are happening. A lot of these webinars are addressing that. But I think we also need to focus on the well-being of us as educators as well as the students. The better off we are, the more we know how to deal with isolation and uh, the other feelings, uh, the better we are at supporting those and understanding our students. I couldn't agree more. That's great. Okay, uh, Lisa, please. I don't have much to add to what my colleagues have already said. I mean, you've really touched on uh, some very important aspects in specifically the well-being and the pedagogy of care and, and not just taking care of our students, but taking care of, our, of ourselves. Um, I guess if I were to say anything about responding to this pandemic is I, I see a, a, a real um, division happening where, where many teachers are, are moving toward policing the students 
um, to making sure that they're the ones that are doing the assignments, to making sure that they come to their lectures, so they sit through the lectures, that they're there for the entire time period. And then there's other, other um, instructors that take more of a, a I guess, a learner-centered approach, and they focus on learner agency and supporting the learners, trusting them to be the people that are actually taking the class, trusting them that they want to learn, um, and, and really uh, supporting the students in, in authentic assessment. And that leads, of course, to the next webinar that's coming up uh, that Tim will talk about. Uh, but it's really looking, giving, giving our students um, more agency, giving them more opportunities to 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 develop and and to explore, uh, to take advantage of the opportunities that online offers. And there are many opportunities. It isn't a deficit form of education, as many of my my colleagues have have you know have stated today. I mean, it's it's really a, a, a genuine, authentic way of learning, and um, there are many opportunities uh, that are there. So I think that we as organizations. Are, are here to to really uh, to tell everyone about these opportunities to to expose them to the research and to provide any kinds of assistance that we can in, in helping people in, in really managing this pandemic. Oh, absolutely, Lisa. Thank you. And um, Reggie, I always uh, seem to end up with you, and I'm really sorry, but uh, can you uh, can you share your views on this? <laughs> it's been an adventure, I think. <clears throat> what I've learned is that uh, we have to foster um, folks being able to make mistakes. Um, and, and we've stumbled many, many years across this entire body, our knowledge base here, uh, and what we have done. And we have a ton of expertise to really share, um, to really help. Uh, what I found is that some institutions, at least in, in higher ed, that had a premier program, that uh, pushed off the, the online folks and said, no, don't touch me. We, we make doctors, we crank out the best cookies. Now, all of a sudden they're living in the uh, distance education place and just uh, you know cramming uh, YouTube labs down the throats of students. And so uh, it's up to us and our associations to really kind of confront that, uh, but also have empathy for the teachers and reaching into the school systems beyond the leadership and getting into the grassroots through our state chapters to really engage with the teachers and help them become comfortable and really know how to service the students. And then also back to everyone here, take care. And Marcy's point, take care of themselves. Uh, you know, and I think, the, you know, some empathy on a global scale. I think we need to, to, to learn. And uh, that's my two cents. <laughs> I think it was more like twenty dollars in two cents. So yes, a wonderful uh, tone to uh, finish the the, uh, the the webinar. Well, I'd like to thank all of our uh, speakers today. I think it's been a, a very constructive and interesting event. I think we've all learned a, um, a lot, and I also like to thank all of you for having attended. And uh, as a final uh, uh, comment on my part, I'd like to encourage you to to come on for our next. Uh, webinar, um, which is taking place at five o'clock. I'm exploring new avenues of online assessment with the speakers, Orna Farrell, Richard Powers, and Aaron S. Blackwelder. And it's moderated by somebody whose name is not really familiar with me. So uh, no, I'm just joking with by Lisa Maria Bleschke. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, be safe. Bye. <laughs>